thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this chat. Uh, I actually started in graduate school, I studied public policy, and my concentration was in urban planning. So I learned about infrastructure, although I don't have a background in engineering. Uh, I took several classes in, in physical infrastructure and urban design. And that, I wasn't thinking about asset management at the time, but that led me to, you know, seems completely in line with asset management. Um, I went after graduate school to work at OMB for the city of New York, uh, the Office of Management and Budget. And then of course I learned about budgeting and you know, financial constraints and the fact that there's never enough to go around. And we did a lot of financial planning. The one thing that's different with the city than the federal government is we were required to have a four-year financial plan. So we didn't just do an annual budget. We did a four-year financial plan, both for the operating budget and the capital side. Wow. Yes. So it was tough. And we had to look at, you know, how are we going to make this work? Where's the revenue coming from? Uh, and of course, cities have the, the ability to issue bonds, which is different. But still, I learned a lot about the budget side. Then I came to GAO and... Uh, I'm mentioning these things because they're all building blocks toward what I'm doing now. Uh, for one of the areas I worked in at GAO was our acquisition and contracting group. So there again, I learned a lot about how contracts work and the huge amount of federal resources that go into contracting and how you manage contracts and the way that you manage contracts makes such a huge, huge difference for how, you, how, how well you're spending the dollars, um, how you monitor them, how you oversee them. And it's really remarkable, uh, especially the, the big defense contracts, uh, how much money we're putting into contracts. And then I round up in the infrastructure group where I am now. I've been there for about seven years. But, but what I came to see, of course, is that you know, budgeting, financial planning, and contracting and acquisition are all parts of asset management. So it just, it just seems to really nicely fit together. And I've been, you know, as I said, I've been in this group for about seven years. Uh, one thing that was interesting, it fit at the time that I started in this group, I also became the uh, president of the condo association for my building. Oh, that's <laughs> asset management. Yeah, so I saw, I was right around the same time. And uh, I won't dwell too much on that, but for any engineers who are listening, uh, I learned all about roof membranes and foundations and the issues of deferred maintenance. Um, we moved into a, a, a building that was over a hundred years old, but had had a gut renovation. So you can only imagine some of the problems. And I was walking around with a construction engineer, uh, learning about all of these things firsthand. And so I got, I got an education on that at the same time that I was starting to do studies at GAO um, on, the on the same issues. <laughs> And stakeholder involvement. Yes, right, exactly. Right, and uh, how do you, you know, the, the importance of investing in things when, when, you know, earlier rather than later. So that was, that was really um, important. And distilling all the information that you gain by your in-person experience into simple language that allows people to say yes or no about the decision. Right, exactly, which, right, which I had to do for all of our, um, all of our condo owners to explain why we needed a special assessment to pay for some of the repairs that were needed. And now click and drag that condo to the size of the United States government right. and it's just the same thing, that's exactly. all. <laughs> exactly, you know, the issues that we deal with, um, and I just wanted to say one more thing, uh, you know, the issues we deal with in the, in the infrastructure group are deferred maintenance, um, excess property, uh, re data reliability, those are, uh, well, you know, and others may know that we have a high risk list at GAO, and uh, managing property is on our high risk list. And it's on our high risk list for those reasons, for, for the reasons of deferred management, excuse me, deferred maintenance, excess property and data that's not reliable. And again, all that is, is under the umbrella of asset management. Okay, so um, most of the people who are attending this understand who the GAO is, but just for the record, since we're recording this, why don't you, you know, briefly explain the GAO, what it does in your role there. 
Sure. Uh, GAO is the Government Accountability Office, and we are an independent agency, which many people don't realize. We're in the legislative branch, but uh, the Controller General who heads the agency is appointed for a term of 15 years. So it's a nonpartisan agency with a nonpartisan uh, leader of the agency. Uh, we, our work is, is at the request of Congress, but it is, it is bipartisan, usually, well, we try to make the work bipartisan, meaning that we try to get both the majority and the minority party to uh, join in the request. Uh, our studies are really based on looking at the performance and accountability of federal programs. So mostly the executive branch, although we do do some work on the legislative branch as well. And some of them are audits. We have a group that does financial audits, but the work that I do is performance related, looking at how well programs are working, and then we make recommendations. Um, we also have a legal group that issues legal decisions um, and bid pro handles bid protests, but the majority of our work is performance audits, performance reviews. So uh, the GAO was explained to me very succinctly by uh, Jack Dempsey, Does the GAO typically is throwing people up against the wall saying, what did you do with our money? <laughs> and uh, sometimes they do studies about what would be good for the government to do. Yes. That the 1957 uh, report on asset management is one of those, what would be good for the uh, government to do? Can you explain how that came about and what your mission was on that? Yes, uh, that, that report is one that we're uh, um, really, really glad that we did. Uh, we looked at um, asset management in terms of a, a broad approach to, to infrastructure and managing assets, as I was mentioning a little earlier. And the ISO 55,000 standard that some people might be interested in, uh, or no, I'm sure some people who are listening already know about it, but the, we developed a framework and the framework is based mostly on the ISO 55,000 standard. And it has to do with um, not managing individual assets, but having a broad approach to asset management. Um, what we did is, well, how we came to do that is that, as I mentioned, many much of our work is focused on aspects of asset management. So we incorporated some of our prior work as well as the ISO 55,000 standard. And then we did a lot of literature review, consulting with experts and um, various other sources, interviews, and we put together a framework. And that framework is really intended to be a simplified design that agencies could use. So what we were trying to do is help agencies to manage better and take a, take a holistic approach to asset management. Yes. So there were these resources out there, you know, ISO 55000 and various other standards, but we wanted to put it together in a way that would be readily accessible and available to agencies. And what has been the result uh, that you have observed or learned about since this was published uh, just a little over two years ago? Yes, well, already, you know, things take, change takes time in government, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. and we don't expect immediate results. But already, uh, we've been really surprised and pleased to see that agencies, some of the large federal departments have already incorporated this framework into their asset management plans and into their capital planning. Um, and I have seen some of the some of the agencies have shared them with me, and they they weren't uh, the agencies that they, they weren't only the agencies that we reviewed. We did some case studies in that report, but it's really gotten attention, wide, broad attention across the government. Um, maybe perhaps in thanks to your conference where I presented the report. Uh, but it's just wonderful to see that agencies are paying attention to it and even if they haven't adopted an entire framework, they are looking at the elements of the framework and they are trying to improve in the, the areas that the framework touches on, for example, quality data. Mm -hmm. That came out in fall of 2019? 
uh, November of 2018. So 2018. Okay. Just over two years. Okay. Um, right. And then what we saw last year at our forum was uh, agencies publicly stating that they are using it. And I don't think they would be, they would, we've been presenting since 2015, 14. Um, and nobody was really saying ISO 55,000, but I think your report gave people cover, you know, and say, we're doing what the GAO is, is you know, pointing us to. So that's uh, pretty good. Can you share any of the specific agencies or is that uh, uh, private information? No, I think, well, I think they're, they would be glad to, to say, I you know the Department of Homeland Security has incorporated, and I think they even mention our, our framework in their asset management framework. They have a fairly robust uh, asset management framework. And you know, that's a huge department with so many yes. different components. That is a, a really remarkable that they have a, such a robust asset management plan. And uh, the Department of State for their civil uh, civil, civilian, um, domestic uh, assets. Uh, yes. the international assets are different, obviously, um, but for their domestic assets, they have done the same and they have followed our framework. Uh, so those are two huge agents and departments that have, have really done a nice job. And I know the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had been looking and, you know, basing much of their actions on ISO 55000, but it wasn't until last year that they say they're actually doing an ISO 55001 strategic asset management plan. So they're right, right. In that too. So um, that led to, well, it didn't lead to other uh, reports, but you've done other reports and with the uh, foundation of information you have from that, um, some recommendations were made. For example, the, the FDA mm -hmm. report that came out last fall recommended that uh, asset management could address some of their issues. Right. We did, uh, we did a report on the FDA on the centers, um, a few centers at the FDA that focused largely on personal property. Um, because the FDA doesn't own its, well, it's, the FDA's real property is, is the space that it uses, which is actually GSA space, but its personal mm -hmm. property is what we looked at, um, which for people who, well, just for some examples, it's lab equipment, um, uh, technology, and some of the huge uh, things that they need to do their research, like, you know, freeze it, freezers and uh, things for, for the medical, you know, the testing that they do. Uh, and uh, what we found is that they really did not have good, um, any kind of good systems in place for quality data, maintaining quality data, and for formal plans and policies, which are two elements of our asset management framework. So we did make several recommendations to them. And that's particularly important because, you know, the FDA, well, you may not know, people may or may not know, that the FDA relies on fees uh, from the applications to fund much of its operations. Uh, and they're in the process of renegotiating those fees. So, they may, that may change. The amount of fees they get may change, which mm. means that they're going to really have to carefully manage the, the funding they get and, and have good systems in place for how they account for their equipment and how they use it and how they decide on what their needs are. Mm -hmm. So that was one area where we applied it. And, um, I'm currently working on, if I can talk a little bit about our current work. That was going to be my next question, so go right ahead. Yeah, I'm really excited about our current work, which is related to natural disasters. And we are applying the framework to see how agencies are incorporating or whether they are incorporating um, natural disasters or resilience, what we're calling it, resilience to natural disasters into their asset management planning. And, you know... During the last year, there's been such a huge, well, there's a trend, but one thing we saw in 2020 was the largest number of hurricanes and extreme weather events that I think in history or in recent history. So it's, we know that climate change is happening and it's becoming more and more common. Uh, 
so the I think that this report is going to be very timely. Uh, what we're looking at is to see whether and how agencies have incorporated the asset, the natural disaster resilience into the framework. And one of the key areas, well, quality data is of course always a key area. The other one is maximizing uh, the portfolio's value, which is one of our key key elements. And you know, you have to be sure that you're putting your dollars into an asset before it's too late, right? You don't want to wait for something to collapse, which does happen during disasters. And then it's an emergency and you need emergency funding, which the federal government does provide a lot of disaster relief funding uh, mm -hmm. through emergency appropriations, but that's not what you want. You want to prevent, you want to put into prevention so that the building doesn't collapse when you have, or to the, to the extent that you can, you know, some yeah. disasters are more serious than others, but um, damage in areas where you know there are going to, there's a greater likelihood of hurricanes or wildfires, as we've seen, uh, you wanna be prevent, do prevention, as they say, you know, fix it first. Um, so that that's, I think that's what we're looking at. And I think that's going to be really, really interesting. I'm really looking forward to that report. Are there any, uh particular agencies you're looking at or any asset types or? We're looking, well, we're focusing on real property and okay. because, you know, buildings and structures, which are most vulnerable to uh, weather, extreme weather events. Yeah. Um, and we are looking at uh, the Department of Interior, um, the Army Corps, uh, GSA, and then some of the components within those agencies. Okay. Uh, so I can't tell you any findings right now, but no. we're, we are, I think we'll, this report should be ready for your conference, your next conference in the fall. So excellent. <laughs> I'm excited. Excellent. And I also think that um, uh, given, given some of the initiatives of the new administration, I think that we may see some changes in addressing climate change. So I'm hoping it will be timely. Well, at least we need to uh, adjust our response to climate change and be prepared for an increasing amount of natural disasters. Yes. It's obvious. Well, it's, it's, data, not, it's a bipartisan understanding. Yes, the data clearly requires, shows. There's more hurricanes. Yeah. The data clearly show, and not only the number, but the severity of the events. Right. So, so thank you for doing that because uh, we've always thought in you know asset management uh, world that uh, getting people's awareness about uh, natural disasters and the, the need for asset management in asset in natural disasters is so important. With uh, our uh, organizational member Grant Thornton and uh, Onuma and others this uh, spring, we talked about uh, personal property equipment. Mm -hmm how to use tools to allow the uh, assets to be shifted around the country where they're needed yeah. in a swarming real-time fashion. Um, but you need to have those in place before the disaster occurs. Anyway, I'm sure your uh, report will uh, help uh, make people aware of this. So thanks for doing that. Um, and then, how about your colleagues? Is there anything your colleagues are doing that you think are is really interesting uh, that we should be aware of? Yes, we do have an ongoing report at the VA Veterans Administration. And uh, one of my peers is working on that, also applying the asset management framework. And the VA does have an asset management uh, program in place, but we're looking at Actually, I think they, they had expressed interest. The VA itself had expressed interest in having us look at that. And uh, we're looking at it. And um, although I'm not doing that work, I am, I am a, a stakeholder. Yeah. I'm a stakeholder on that work and applying our framework and seeing where their program could be improved. Maybe. Well, that's great that they're asking you for that. Um, and uh, going back to the FDA report, I remember you saying that when it was presented to the FDA, they were in agreement with some of your of the findings. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Well, we do make recommendations. I, I think I mentioned that, but we, we know things don't happen quickly, and we do have agencies have three years to 
we, we monitor and we give agencies three years and we close the recommendations in, in year four. So they did agree with all of our recommendations and we try to phrase the recommendations or, or um, present them in a way that the agencies will be able to implement them within, within the time frame. So they should be making progress on those. It hasn't been long. We issued that report in September and um, three months. We don't, we don't expect to see things happen that quickly, but they are working on them and they definitely agreed that they would be implementing them. Okay, so now we have questions and we actually have somebody uh, raising their hand. Uh, Rich Culbertson, uh, I saw you raise your hand. It would be best if you uh, in, uh, use the chat or question and answer, uh, and we'll get the question to Amelia. Um, so uh, David has asked if uh, you can go back to your New York days and uh, talk about the value of planning when you update your plan on that four-year cycle, the, met the methodology, uh, it's got to be a little different when you're planning beyond just the next year. Any uh, insights on how those two vary? Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, it, it's different in the operating budget and the capital plan, obviously. Uh, but I'll, I'll speak to the, well, both are relevant for asset management. In the operating budget, you may know of program changes that are coming up. Uh, for example, you may know that a program is going to start in a couple of years. You look at the agency's plan. So we work at OMB, we worked very closely with the agencies so we could know what they were doing and then we would build that into the financial plan. Mm -hmm. And then it's a four year financial plan and it's adjusted every year. So each year when we did the, the budget for the fiscal year, for the next fiscal year, we would update the financial plan. The capital budget is of course, based on a capital plan, mostly construction or um, rehabilitation, uh, you know, of major rehabilitation of buildings. But even mm -hmm. still, you know what construction is, is coming. Is you, you know, the agencies have to have a, cons a, a capital plan for Construction has to be planned, obviously. So we would do the same. We would build that in. And that was a longer plan. We actually had a 10 year capital plan um, because as you know, construction is long-term and, and, and has to be, um, you, you start design and, and each step um, uh, long before you actually start construction. But the basic answer is we knew what the plans were and we would build that in if new programs were starting or uh, on the on the other hand, if programs were ending, we could we could take them out of the budget, things like that. Okay, I think that answers uh, what uh, uh, David had uh, asked. Um, then we've got uh, Bob Leach asking: Does the upcoming GAO report on resilience address planning, design, construction, and operation and maintenance of existing or new infrastructure to increase its resistance, or does it focus only on the application? of resilience uh, spe specifically on recovery from those events? Oh, well, actually we're not looking at recovery. We're looking only at, at the, the planning. We're looking at how, uh, how agencies have incorporated it into their asset management plans. So, so the, first, the first part, Bob. Um, and um, I, I think that, uh, means that they better get their resiliency in their plan. Yes, right, exactly. Yes. Yeah, it better yes. be in the plan. Okay. So whoever's consulting with the Army Corps, uh, I don't know, <laughs> that's a joke, it's a joke. So. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure Bob is laughing too. Uh, I don't know if we have anyone from the Army Corps listening, but. <laughs> Um, so Amelia, Richard Culbertson asks, uh, do you use the green book? The, well, GAO uses the green book. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. That the green book is on internal controls. I don't know if everyone knows what the green book is, but yes, the green book is, is authored by GAO and we use it in our audits. If, if applicable, it's on uh, internal control standards. Okay, so you do use it internally 
yeah, in addition to applying its principles in your reports and studies of yes, yes. activities. Yes. So, uh, uh, Rich is on to something in terms of having uh, uh, people uh, adopt asset management in order to meet the requirements of the Green Book, because basically the Green Book says you have to manage your assets and doesn't say how, mm -hmm. but some 55,000 structures allows people a way to meet the requirements of the Green Book. Right. And Yes, in some ways. That's a longer conversation, but yes, yeah. in, some ways, in some ways it does. In yeah. some ways, right. Yeah. So then uh, we have, um, how do you manage, uh, from Cecilia Moat, how do you manage stakeholder involvement in accordance with ISO 55000 when you are looking at performance reviews? Um, do you look at customer satisfaction and equality of service delivery? Who might be impacted by the underlying assets program you are reviewing? You mean performance reviews within the agency, I'm guessing. Yes. The, well, yeah. I'm guessing. Okay, well, we do have part of our framework is um, has to do with resource agency resources, and that includes employees, staff. Uh, so that is is that would be part of that element of our framework, uh, where the performance evaluation aspect would take into account how well the employees are are implementing asset management. There's also a leadership component. I don't know that I can really explain that whole piece right now, but the leadership obviously have a role in how they're managing resources and and training staff or employees to implement asset management. So it's a shared responsibility. It wouldn't only, I don't think it would be fair to only hold the employees accountable in their performance evaluations. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, and good timing on the answer of your question. Thank you, Amelia. I could see the time was almost 4.30, so. Um, well, thank you so much, Amelia. Um, before people get off here, I just want to quick flash our uh, sponsor slide because, again, without these patron members, ABS Group and Onuma, as well as our organizational members, uh, this production would not be possible. So just want to thank these organizations for participating in the Asset Leadership Network and supporting us. Uh, and one more thing. Next week, we have Bill Garrett on February 4th, Thursday. It'll be at 4 p.m. Eastern, just like this uh, production. And we hope everyone can join us then. Um, and with that, I don't know if there's more questions, Mike, but I'll pass it back to you guys. Now, this has uh, been a very uh, precise and concise presentation. Thank you very much, Amelia. Uh, if you would like to uh, say anything, I'll let you have the closing words. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's it's really been really interesting doing this work on asset management, and we're building a portfolio. I'm looking forward to more work uh, after we complete this climate change uh, natural disaster resilience report, and uh, I look forward to presenting at your conference in the fall. Excellent. We look forward to it. Uh, thank you again for everything you do. My pleasure. Thank you.